tiny in all that air. The Philip Larkin Society Podcast. Hello and welcome to Tiny and All That Air, the Philip Larkin Society podcast. In this podcast, the inimitable James Booth takes us on the third part of his breakneck journey through Larkin's life and poetry. James discusses his own books on Larkin, Larkin's early schoolgirl poetry and Larkin's astonishing use of language. Expect lots of laughter and even a few tears. He somehow, right at the start of his career, and the strange thing, that's why I wanted to focus on this, because you're asking me what has been going on recently in my mm. Larkin. I mean, I've gone through the whole thing. I've, I've wrote, written academic books on him. The first one was probably the best of the academic books, Philip Larkin Writer, which is basically a student introduction. It's just mm. a string of explications with a bit of biography. And the biography wasn't terribly well known there, so mm. I got some of it wrong. Yeah. But it was quoted by Motion. I, I got a few things in that book which Motion quotes in his biography because it came out before that. That book is probably the best one. Then I wrote The Poet's Plight, which got tangled up and the Paul Grave didn't like it. And they, oh God, that was so unpleasant. And then I was going to write the third one with Paul Grave mm. as their writers um, and their work series oh. or whatever it's called. And I was going to do that quite cynically because I was due to retire. And although my, this is the nonsense of the academic world, utter, complete bureaucratic nonsense. Mm -hmm. I realised that the dean was telling me I couldn't get a study leave because my research would not count in the RAE because the research selectivity exercise, because I wasn't, wouldn't be employed by the university because I would have retired. Oh, right. Okay. So I couldn't get a study leave. Mm -hmm. I went to the vice chancellor and he sorted it out and I got the study. Mm -hmm. But I still had to have a CV which suggested that I was writing something significant that would be published, even though it wouldn't be counted. Yeah. I was the head of department, so I yeah. had to look as though I was yeah. part of the system. <laughs> yeah. So I got this contract for Writers and Their Work series and I started to write it cynically. Mm -hmm. But Larkin is such an inspiring subject and so great. <laughs> And there was so much I hadn't actually ever yeah, quite said about yeah. him that it just grew on my hands. And after a bit, this is just before I retired, I thought, I'm going to finish this book. And it, it can't be the book that Paul Grave want. They want a little neat mm. um, book. They, they, paper that they finally realised that I'm the bee's knees, that I'm the real thing, because <laughs> they didn't realise it. They used to send me the most appalling, insulting readers' reports on my books that I don't know who they found to read them. But they would say, you know, Booth says that Larkin is a great poet. Why do I find myself bursting my buttons to say he's not? <laughs> who is this idiot? You know, a page and a quarter. Whereas I used to write four or five pages of detailed criticism. Mm. And someone whose book I told them to reject, an American, wrote to me afterwards and said, I guess that it must be you who wrote the uh, wrote, I'd really like to write more like you. Could you tell, give me some advice on to how to make my well, book better? And I told yeah. Paul Grave to reject her book. <laughs> um, they, and she published it in the end. It's quite a good book. So I did the proper thing. But mm. the people they employed to read my books just insulted me all the time. They did it three or four times. Anyway, they finally realised I was good. So they wanted this book. And when I realised I didn't want them to publish it because I realised by then the penny finally dropped that I'd known Mae Brennan, I'd known mm. Monica, I'd been an interviewed her before she died. I hadn't known her, in, unfortunately, earlier on. I didn't know Amy's, I didn't know Conquest. But I knew all the people in Hull. I yeah. knew um, yeah. Jean and other people who'd known him. And I went round and interviewed the people who drank with him at the bar mm. and all kinds of mm. things like that. So I had first-hand stuff and I'd had anecdotes from Ray Brett that I'd never told anybody yeah. and so on. And I suddenly thought, I'm writing his biography. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the only person who can write a first-hand biography apart from Motion, who set out to do it as the official biography yeah. back in 1992. And I'll, mine will be different because I don't think, like Motion did, that he was a lazy man. And I don't think that he was a cruel and vindictive mm. man. And I don't think he let the women in his life down. Mm. I think he was a martyr to them, actually. Mm. And I'll get it right. And also, I understand his sense of humour. Yeah. He loved mm. the goon show. Mm. 
his favourite Goon Show um, episode was The Fear of Wages, which is, <laughs> which is just a brilliant joke in yeah. itself, just as a yeah. title, The Fear yeah. of Wages. Yeah. Uh, the Wages of Fear, <laughs> yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, where the Third World War takes place on two lorries going across Europe <laughs> full of um, nitroglycerin that's about to go off any minute. And Bloodknock has already drunk some, so, you know, it's going to not end well, you know. <laughs> and um, he, he writes to Monica, I think, says how funny it is and whatever. And um, Motion doesn't have that sense of humour no. at all. He just doesn't get it. So when when Larkin told him that he was a lazy man and told him that he was bored out of his mind and his life was meaningless, M- Motion believed him. Mm. And it's not true. He was acting the part. Well, maybe, no, maybe I'm wrong. Andrew's book is brilliant in its research. Mm. And he did know Larkin and he can say things about him. He knew him in a way which I didn't. He went out of his way to do so. But he's shocked by things in Larkin, which would never have shocked me for a second. I was really surprised when the letters came out and the whole literary world was shocked. Mm. I mean, I've been spending my days teaching Byron. You read Byron's letters. Mm. The idea that Larkin's letters are shocking compared with Byron's letters, I mean, it's balmy. Yeah, yeah. And they're so funny and they're so, you know. But um, it all boils down to the simple thing, which... If I was Andrew, I'd feel embarrassed by it. And he obviously did feel embarrassed by mm. it because I have to run stuff by him when I write it. And he's always been immaculate with me. He's always been perfect. He's yeah. never put any obstacle in my way whatsoever. He's always been extremely helpful. Yeah. And I'm extremely grateful to him for that. But as you know, as you can see, I have these fundamental differences. Yeah, when, when, Gene, yeah. when Gene Hartley said he made up to Larkin and then stabbed him in the back after he died... I do think, unfortunately, there is some truth in that. Oh, I didn't know Jean Hartley had said that. Yes, she yeah. said it. Um, mm. And she mm. that's what she believed. Mm. Now, when I was doing Letters Home, I was in touch with um, Larkin's sister's daughter, who is still alive. Mm. And she gave me Larkin's sister's reaction to Motion's biography. Oh, okay. She died before it came out, but mm. she read the proofs. And her daughter remembered a phrase that she'd said about it when she'd read it. There's no love in it. And Andrew wanted me to try and phrase that or put it into a paragraph in a way which made it less as though, as he put it, I was scoring a point off him. Because, of course, my book is called Philip Larkin, Life, Art and Love. Yeah, yeah. Um, Because I think that's the right way to put it. And also, people don't... No one has seen the joke. When I chose that title. I thought it's a bit odd. It should be Life, Love and Art, shouldn't mm. it? Or something. And then I thought, no, Life, Art and Love. Um, Twitter and everything had come in by then. So I thought, L-A-L, L-O-L, you know, yeah. Life, Art and Love. I thought, oh, it's a bit, you know, it's got that slight little echo there. But also I thought if Larkin was still alive and was writing about this book that someone had produced mm. called that, and he was writing, say, a letter to Kingsley Amis about it, he would, of course, write, have you seen this latest book called Lie, Fart and Love? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a load of... Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and I thought, <laughs> and, and no one has ever picked up on it. And I was so pleased with the joke. Oh. But there you are. No, I'm glad because it is a serious book, so it's... people shouldn't pick on it too much. But it, it is there. And uh, I had it in my mind, very much in the back of my mind. Mm. But um, what I was going to say, which I'd forgotten, was that Motion knew Larkin at the Mm. wrong time, Mm. just as I knew Monica at the wrong time. Monica was a brilliant woman. I've got a rather jaded view of Monica because I saw her when she was already bedridden and there wasn't much to her. She was, you know, she did her best and she was, you could still get an idea of her, but it wasn't the same woman that I know that, say, some of my colleagues had met earlier on a few years before. And I think the same with Motion. He met him in what, from 79 onwards. And he wasn't writing any great poetry at the time. Mm, mm. And he knew he wasn't. And it made him profoundly depressed. Mm. And it robbed his life of most of its meaning. Mm. And that's what Motion read. And that's what Motion saw in him. And it's a bit unfortunate that that rubs off. He he said, I think... um, I think he's printed it, but he said it to me, is that, that, 
that he, he fell out fell out of love with Larkin at some point during the writing. Mm. He fell back in love with him again because of the poetry. Yeah. But yeah. as everyone would. Yeah. Uh, but he fell out of love with him because he, he didn't like him. Yeah. Well, I no way I wouldn't like him, whatever. You know, I think everything about him is likable. Yeah. Um, and that's what, you know, is wrong about most of the early criticism mm. of him. Because he's not uh, the person that they, everyone who knew him liked him. Mm. And yeah. they really yeah. did. Yeah. There's almost no one will say a word against him no. who actually knew him. And even the things that might seem negative, the, it's yes. always kind of, there's a, a sense of humour or pra exactly. practicality or something yes. behind it. Yes. He had a reason for what he yes. was doing. I have no enemies. But my friends don't like me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what a nonsense thing to say. Yeah. I mean, complete rubbish. I mean, it doesn't mean yeah. anything at all. But yeah. it's very funny yeah. to say it. I can't remember. I don't think he got it from anywhere else. He no. didn't actually say it. Yeah. Um, but um, to get back to the copy that you really want, um, he found his poetic vein early, and he found it in the oddest way in this early phase of his career, which is really pretty well located to June to October 1943. Mm. He came out of Oxford. He told Motion, writing poured out of me. It was as though a bottle had been uncorked. Yeah, yeah. And what came out of him was Brunette Coleman. Now, what kind of a young Oxford undergraduate male, heterosexual, writes lesbian fiction in the persona of a jazz band leader called... <laughs> Well, Blanche Coleman was a yeah. jazz band leader, yeah. and she didn't die till 2004. You can look at her picture. I can't find a photograph of her. If you yeah. can find a photo, anybody Blanche listening Coleman. to this podcast can find a photograph of Blanche Coleman playing with her orchestra in mm. the 1940s. There are a few photographs of her, but only in her 90s when she was just before she died. Mm. Uh, it would be lovely to see yeah. a picture of her orchestra yeah. because he called Brunette Coleman Brunette because she was Blanche Coleman's sister. Yeah. And first of all, got into it because Amos was feeding him all kinds of pornographic stimuli in a very, very crude kind. Anna Lucaster, he called his lesbian authoress, and Larkin responded with Brunette Coleman. Mm. Um, there's very little of that survives from 1941 to two when he knew Amos. Amos disappeared from Oxford after 13 months, and he never actually met Amos again for more than a few hours for the whole of the rest of his oh, life, really? yeah. a day or two at the most. You know, he stayed with him in the 50s, for a day or two. Yeah. Know, but then most of the later part of his life, they would just meet up in London every now yeah. and then. They went, and Amos didn't even come all the way to Hull. No, no. When, yeah. when he came to the funeral, mm. he just went to Cottingham. Yeah. Uh, and then he, after he got home, he said, I feel I never really knew him. And he didn't, he, he didn't really know him. He just hadn't mm. got the depth to understand mm. him. He just didn't understand any the first thing about him. But so when Larkin wrote the Brunette Coleman stuff, after he got his first class degree, went home to Warwick, sat in his upstairs flat looking down at the plum trees in the garden and across mm. to the rugby field and cricket fields, I think there were across, mm. hearing the balls, like whatever, I imagine this, and moving the jam that is in that famous poem about his father dying mm. through to the cupboard in this upstairs room. That's where he wrote all this stuff, in Warwick, Coat and End. And... Um, I've been there, you know, you've right. seen it. Yeah. And seen the, the last surviving plum tree, which isn't there anymore. It's finally mm -hmm. gone. But, um, uh, and what he wrote was the product of his, all that had gone before. Amos had disappeared. There was Montgomery, much more interesting, less pressured mm. influence. They weren't competing mm. with each other. Montgomery mm. was a completely different sort of person. Encouraged him to be flippant, encouraged him to be... To experiment. Was he a friend to, from school? No, from, from um, he, he was he was doing modern language, which was a four year degree. Right. So he was still there when oh. Larkin uh, was in his third year. Yeah. And he'd already written um, a, a crime fiction book, um, and in fact, his books are still read. Uh, Jovey's Fen is his um, uh, Poirot, as it, if if you like. Oh right. right. Uh, and. Um, he wrote several of them and then wrote the music for some of the um, Carry On films. He was a mm -hmm. musician as well. Mm -hmm. So he was a real figure in Oxford, looking like, you know, the Renaissance man, you know, with mm -hmm. all the talents mm -hmm. and he boasting. He was writing a book called The End of Western Civilization or something like that. And Larkin got onto this kind of bandwagon, mm -hmm. completely different from Amos, mm -hmm. and br brought up Brunette Coleman again, partly in response to him and partly in response to this rather unfortunate and dim figure. Diana Gollantz, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. who um, unfortunately um, 
Bradford, in his first edition of his book of photographs, puts a photograph of her in which Larkin has written on the back, Diana Gollant's uh, 1943. Um, he writes, that, uh, Larkin is inexplicably written Diana Gollant's on the back of this picture of Ruth Bowman. <laughs> <laughs> and you look at them, they've got the same hairstyle. Right. They've got the same look. They're both wearing blouses. Yeah. Then you look and you say, oh, wait a minute. Diana Gollins is back from the camera with a world-weary look on her face. Yeah. A Jewish refugee, son, daughter of a Jew, Jewish refugee, Victor Gollins, the yeah, publisher, yeah. The who publishes, published yeah. Montgomery's books. Yeah. Um, eventually. So there's a connection. And Larkin sent Trouble at Willow Gables to one of the companies that Gollins' organisation right. had set up. Right. Hoping that Trouble at Willow Gables could actually be published. If yeah. that had been published in yeah. 1943... What would his reputation be? What would his yeah. career have yeah. been after that? Yeah. Anyway, so 1943 is a key year. He got his first class degree. He went down from Oxford, wrote, and what does he do? He writes in the persona of a girls' school story writer. He reads at least 10, probably 20 or more works. He knows them, for, he's really familiar with them. Mm. He knows the genre. He picks up genre. And this for Larkin is a, is a key leap forward. Mm. It's what you haven't quite got properly in the North Ship. Mm. They're all too mm. sincere. Mm. Mm. He's doing the romanticism out of trying to pretend that he's got it in his... But he's not. It's all genre stuff, yeah. really. Yeah. It's all imitation Yeats. Yeah. It's all, um, it's all world-weariness sort of put on. Yeah. And when it's good, it's very good like that. It can be brilliant, you know. We have too much of moonlight and self-pity. <laughs> <laughs> and it's well written. Yeah. Uh, but before that, he came out of his kind of very immature Auden stage, which actually some of the books, some of the poems he wrote, you know, sex is not a matter of, what does he write? Sex is a matter of, oh, shapely necks. The rhyme is brilliant. Anyway, that's a, that's a, that's a, a school poem. Right. So he, he could always, he could do it from the very yeah, beginning. Yeah, yeah. But the first time he hits the vein, it's the Larkin-esque vein, mm. is in the genre of the girls' school story. Mm. And the poems, there are seven of them in the end. He wrote six, put them in a book, a little booklet, Sugar and Spice, which yeah. he carefully bound in art paper covers and typed the title, SSS, PPP, Sugar and Spice, mm. down the column mm. in red and black to make a title page. Yeah. Carbon copies, three carbon copies, so there are four limited edition copies. Yeah. One he gave to Miriam Plout, interestingly mm. enough. He, he said he was going to send it to Betjeman, but he didn't. Right. Betjeman was already there yeah. at the time. The other one he gave to Amos, and Amos Montgomery, and uh, kept one himself. Yeah. So Sugar and Spice, these poems, hit what... You hit, he hits again in some of the less deceived poems. Mm. The uh, cliche, the uh, sentimental little phrase, the odd commonplace phrase, which somehow you can put it into a context where it's it suddenly is electrified. Yeah, um, yeah. Poor soul, say they, at their own distress. You know, poor soul. Uh, or... Um, they fuck you up, your mum and dad. You know, yeah, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Um, he, he gets that kind of idiomatic, commonplace use of language at one remove through imitating the girls' school story. Mm. And you think, wait a minute, how, why does he do that? How does he do that? It's because he, he is essentially trying to find some kind of performative genuineness. And it has to be literary. It has to, it, it's too young to write about women in any profound way. Yeah. So he reads the girls' school stories and he's got he's profound enough to pick up all which Amy's wouldn't have picked up for a second. He'd have just drooled over them and looked at them as sex objects and so on. To pick up that they're real, you know, they've got real girls with real I, I would have at that age I wouldn't have had the faintest clue. I would have just been so confused yeah. and um, upset by it. I just yeah. couldn't yeah. but he did it. So yeah. when when he writes, say, the school in August, all of a sudden you think this isn't like late Larkin, but it is like late Larkin in a, yeah. a very profound way. And the profound way it's like late Larkin is that he's got an idiom and he can inflect it and it's real and it's real people. And most of all, 
it's elegiac. Mm. He's got the knack of genre. You know Liechtenstein's paintings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the cartoon. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Brad, I love you, but, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. um, as this girl is sort of looking as she's going under the waves or whatever. Yeah. Um, and he picks up, he and Monica had this joke about um, Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, yeah. hopeless writer, but, um, you know, great romantic sort of figure. I am Mrs. de Winter now, which in the film is brilliantly done in the, it's, Hitchcock, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah where yeah. she says this to the sinister woman who's yeah, <laughs> yeah. keeping the memory of the old Mrs. De Winter. Yeah. I am Mrs. De Winter now, you know. And you think somehow or other that's got such a resonance about mm. it. You know? It's like um, it's got the same sort of resonance of the genre resonance of um, Gather Ye Rosebuds While Ye mm. May, mm. or those phrases from the 17th century which sort of pick up one of these permanent themes. And what gets them, got, gives them their permanency is that they relate straight to one of the fundamental basics of human life. Mm. So the Brad Lichtenstein things all relate to war or love or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And they sum it up somehow in mm. a way which is amusing, and interesting and enchanting and somehow vivid because they're removed from the mess of actual real life, yeah, which is yeah, why Larkin yeah. has this problematic with the novel. Because mm. he wants to have that mess in and he can't do it. He doesn't want to do it, really, because he's a yeah. poet. Yeah, yeah. So the school in August, it's a girls' school story, poem, about girls in, a, in one of these stories. It's exactly right, or not exactly right, but almost exactly right. It's a bit, bit too frank about uh, possible lesbianism to be exactly right, to <laughs> be one of them. But there's plenty of lesbianism in the ones written by women. You know, it's just a yeah, bit more hidden, yeah, you know. Yeah. And... Fundamentally, it's elegiac. He quotes in the essay. He actually wrote an essay on girls' school stories, mm. which deliberately answers Orwell's essays, essay on boys' school stories. Mm. And it's brilliant. And no one reads it. No one knows it. No. But Orwell's essay from 1941, Horizon, is well known. 1940, I think. Larkin's answer to it is repost about girls' school stories, which you think feminists would have picked it up. One or two feminists have, oh, okay. but they've got nowhere with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're the only people who took this book seriously. Yeah. One or two feminists yeah. did, yeah. but they're not reliable. One of them said, interesting, Booth actually gets this right, even though it's a man. I can't quite understand <laughs> it, you know. <laughs> so, you know, the correctnesses are beginning to build up already. Um, but he quotes a lovely bit from Dorita Fairley Bruce, who writes um, some of the best of these stories about mm. Dimsey, the Dimsey, Dimsey books. Yeah, if you yeah. talk to women of a certain age, they all know the Dimsey book. <laughs> women a bit younger know the Enid en Blyton yeah, versions. Yeah. And it's beautiful. It's well written. She puts it in the front of Dimsey Moves Up Again, which is one of the books that Larkin definitely read because he mentions it. And, and she puts it in the beginning of this book, addressing her readers. And, if, and who are her readers? Her readers are old girls from the school, mm. of course, to the old girls of Roehampton, mm. she says. And if from words of mine you catch the breath of the old cedar's scent, or hear blithe young voices cheer the match across the sunny field, or see forgotten faces flushed with glee, I shall be well content. Mm. And you think, yeah. <laughs> there are all these middle-aged women reading <laughs> these books about an imaginary happy school days, which yeah, none yeah. of them really actually yeah. led. Yeah. But still, you know, they were young then, and yeah. now they're old. And as long yeah. as they weren't actually you know, abuse or anything, they yeah. will have memories of themselves young, yeah. will, will be more vivid and interesting than memories of themselves old, yeah. you know. <laughs> so it's the standard, brilliant, elegiac mode. Mm. So what does he do? He makes this into a kind of mythic, well, it's like Virgil, you know, a Virgil eclogue, or um, it is, that's mm. what it is. Mm. Or um, the Theocritus' idols, you know, they're about nymphs and shepherds mm. and whatever which is what the 17th century was so good at as well, that kind of carpe diem kind of theme. Yeah, That's yeah, one of the main yeah. themes. And it's related, of course, to the whole elegiac mm. theme. But elegy is one of the fundamental themes. And although Larkin wrote very few, in fact, he wrote no direct essay about any human being except his father. That's the only mm. one. Mm. And a lot of people say they're the only proper elegies. But no, the greatest elegies are elegies for the whole shebang. They're for the author of the poem, they're for the person he's commemorating, if he is commemorating a person, or the people, in the case mm. of Grey's Elegy, it's a whole village, a whole yeah, yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. Um, or it's for the reader. And that's when it hits it. 
And Larkin does it in this most peculiar artificial way. The school in August. The cloakroom pegs are empty now and locked the classroom door. The hollow desks are dim with dust and slow across the floor a sunbeam creeps between the chairs till the sun shines no more. Who did their hair before this glass? Who scratched Elaine loves Jill on drowsy summer sewing class with scissors on the sill? Who practiced this piano whose notes are now so still? Ah, notices are taken down and workbooks stowed away and seniors grow tomorrow from the juniors today. And even swimming groups can fade. Games mistresses turn grey. <laughs> You know, the games mistress should never turn grey. No, you know? I love that line. <laughs> and one of, one of the best responses to the book that came out, oddly enough, when it came out, um, as I say, it sank like a, a lead balloon. In fact, it got some pretty sneering reviews from people who ought to have known better. Mm. No one was prepared to do the, make the effort yeah. to understand what Larkin was actually yeah. doing. They all thought it was just silly, trivial pornography. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, Private Eye. Larkin lesbian poem found. <laughs> they fuck you up, your mum and her living friend who used to be a games mistress. <laughs> P. Larkin Hull, 1963. <laughs> oh, but uh, had he published that poem, I think he wouldn't have written Home is So Sad in the same mm. way. It's very interesting. Mm. Best society is ver de, ver de Societe. Yeah. And... Had he published Best Society, it was unpublished. Right, oh, yeah. It remained unpublished till after his death. Yeah. Had he got it into print, I don't think he could have written Vers de Societe because mm. he never writes the same poem twice. No. Or anything like it. Mm. That's really what used to bug me, trying to teach Larkin mm. to students. I'd do a poem with them and I'd think, right, well, move on next time to another poem <laughs> like that one. And I think, wait a minute, there isn't another poem no, like that one. You, you can't know. put them in. You can't do it. There's, no, no. And, and I, I think there are a few artists like this. The one, the one who strikes me as most like it is Ravel. If you know Ravel's music, mm. he never repeats himself. He writes uh, two piano concertos, one sombre one for the left hand only because it was written for someone whose right hand had been lost mm. in the war. One for both hands and brilliant and jazzy and yeah. absolutely superb with a superb slow movement. He writes one violin sonata which is full of jazz uh, and odd and mm. no others. He writes an opera for children and so on you go. He wrote Bolero, his most famous. In fact, I think yeah. that's what he was referring to when he said, I've only written one masterpiece and there's no music in that. <laughs> <laughs> And he writes a, a pavan. Who wrote pavans? You know, a pa pavan for a dead infanta. And you think, what the fuck is that? He writes these straight, and it is a pavan. It's a proper three part pavan where right. each part is. So it's, it's got the um, slightly archaic uh, early Renaissance structure that a pavan mm. has. Mm. Each one is a separate, distinct, different thing from mm. any other. There are some artists, a few artists like that. But well, Larkin didn't like to repeat words even, did he? No. And in fact, that was the most uncanny thing I found. In fact, the chap who did the great big um, concordance of his work mm. said it sent shivers down his spine when he read what I'd written about it because it, he'd realised it as he was compiling the concordance. It's, it was just before the, before the computers came in and the, you know, now, of oh, course, you right. can put it all on the internet. But if you look at particular words in it... I love concordances. Um, it's, it's uncanny, it really is. And you realise really subtle things. Like, um, he doesn't use the word extinction until the end. Mm. And you think, he's writing moody poems, Yeatsian mm. poems about mm. death and whatever. At school he's writing them mm. and whatever. He doesn't use the word. And you think, why? Extinction. Yeah. Uh, extinction's out. And then there's, you know, Bard, he uses extinction again. Mm. He, he uses it twice. That's unusual. He doesn't mm. usually use the word twice. You, or if he does, it's different. I think Larkin had a whole thesaurus in his head mm. in the 1940s. And he was flailing around a bit, writing poems. 46, 47, when he starts using the workbook. And that's before he really hits maturity. Mm. He suddenly starts to ration himself mm. with his words. Mm. And then after that, when he's used a word, he won't use it again. Mm. The thing that struck me the most was uh, a Larkin-esque word, unsatisfactory. 
Right, okay. You look in the, you look in the concordance and Larkin uses it four times in his poetry after 1947. Mm. Four times, right? Mm. All in the same poem. He's one of the very few poets who, like Shakespeare, like Keats, can manage to write a whole poem in the most complicated rhyme scheme imaginable. Yeah. And you have to ask yourself afterwards, did it rhyme? Yeah. Now, almost all poets can't do that. Yeah. They just cannot do it. And you think, how does he do it? Because some of the rhymes are quite forced. Yeah. You look at me and think, but he's got away with it. You don't feel it when you read it's it. It's astonishing. Unless you're meant to. Sometimes yeah, you're sometimes, meant to. Yeah. <laughs> it does always make me think of Keats. Yes. Cute and sonnets. you think that, 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 some, that, some, that, I think, is is magic. There is something about that kind of use of language. Yeah. Which I think is so deep yeah. that you can't get at it. There's yeah. no explanation of it. No. And very, very few people have got it. It's like Mozart having perfect pitch, so he could mm. tell an eighth note apart. If yeah. Was, if yeah. Note was an eighth out of tune. He could tell. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> when I when I used to teach Frost, we used to look at like meter in Frost. I used yes. to think there was something really magical about meter. Yeah. And. Um, but six formers find that quite hard <laughs> yes. when you're teaching at secondary school. It's all they, Rhyming, and I'd sit there and go, do the old A, B, C, D, they, they E, just, F thing. And the just, kids would be looking and going, how is that? They just want sincerity, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, anyway, fourth former loquitur. This poem, I think, I love this poem. Well, one reason is personal reason is I managed to work out that it is finished because it's inserted on a loose sheet of holograph in the Sugar and Spice volume, in Larkin's copy, not yeah. in any other copy, so there's only one copy of it. And he'd written it out on one sheet of paper and he put it in, and he obviously put it in at the very last minute, in October, even November 1943. Mm. And of course, the Brunette Coleman phase ended abruptly. Mm. When he went to Wellington on the 1st of December, I think, or the 30th of November, one or the other, before that, he he, he glued the pages he typed of the second novella, um, Michaelmas Termits and Brides, he glued the pages he typed over the written pages in his holograph copy, mm. left it unfinished, closed it up, wrote the poem to Monica in, in 1971 when he was in Oxford writing. So he took it with him to Oxford, mm. interestingly, mm. to remember Oxford. And then he put this poem, because he'd obviously not been able to stop writing poems. After he'd done the carefully stitched Sugar and Spice volume with six poems in it. He'd written another one and a more ambitious one and in many ways the best one. But he then gives it unfortunately a title which he was young, he was ambitious, he was doing difficult impossible things which people today can't quite come to terms with. Mm. So he gives it the title Fourth Form Loquitur. A locutor being the deponent verb to speak, mm. locor, or if you don't, if you did do it Latin, some of us did, I didn't do it that much, but I know it's a deponent verb. And so locutor means be spoken, means speak, mm. speaks. So locutor means the fourth former speaks. Well, he puts it in Latin, fourth mm. former locutor. Mm. So it's going to put off most readers. Mm. But actually, it's a beautiful poem about this kind of mythic, fourth former and the two categories that matter most in the girls school stories are fourth formers and sixth formers mm. anyway so he gives it the latin title which puts everyone off and then he has this beautiful elegy where the fourth former looks forward to the sixth form when they're going to come back they're going to go through the fifth to the sixth and they're going to become and then they're going to become old girls mm. and she looks at it from the point of view of the old girls cricket match Fourth former loquitur. A group of us have flattened the long grass where through the day we watched the wickets fall far from the path. Wenda has left her hat and only I remain now they are gone to notice how the evening sun can show the unsuspected hollows in the field when it is all deserted. Here they lay, Wenda and Brenda, Kathleen and Elaine and Jill shock-headed and the pockets of her blazer full of crumbs while over all the sunlight lay like amber wine, matured by every minute. Here we sprawled, bare-legged, and talked of mistresses and poetry, Shelley and Miss Lacaine, and heard the tale once more of Gwyneth and the garden rake. <laughs> 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 
Grass between clear-cut lips that never yet thrill to the rouge. A school bag full of books. Todd Hunter's algebra. For end of term does not mean you can slack. And dusty feet bare-toed in sandals. Thus we lay, and thus the filmy clouds drew out like marble veins. The sun burned on. The great old whispering trees lengthened their shadows over half the pitch. Deck chairs that the governors had filled grew empty, and the final score was hung to show for once the old girls had been licked. Ah, what remains but night time for the bats? The, this flattened grass and all the scores to be put in the magazine. Be not afraid, Brenda and Wenda, Kathleen and Elaine and brown legged Jill. Three years lie at your back and at your feet three more. In just a week, the end of term will part us to the pale and stuccoed houses we loved so much. Wenda, Brenda, Kathleen and Elaine have flattened down the long grass where they've lain, and brown leg Jill has left her hat, for they have gone to laugh and talk with those who've played out the old girl's match to its close. <laughs> I find one of its most moving, yeah. it's oddly... Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, I mean, it's just a silly little poem about about something that Larkin knew absolutely nothing about, but mm. it's about death. Yeah. And it's about the fact that we all have rituals, we all have notions, we all have memes that we associate mm. with our youth, with life, the, the game's mistress, Jill, her pocket full of crumbs. Mm. I mean, what a brilliant line. <laughs> and there he is in 1943 at the age of 20. Yeah. yeah. At the age of 20, writing something as sophisticated mm. and complex as that mm. and with so much emotion in it. And yet emotion which somehow or other is... Well, again, Mozart comes to mind. People have said this about Mozart. Sometimes there are works by him. And you can say, you know, this is the, the last movement of his string trio. You know, it's just pure euphoria. It just yeah, yeah. bounces along. It's lovely. Yeah. The, the second movement of K516, the quintet, is, is, is just... It's so sad. It's just so, so, so very sad. And then there are others that you think they're profound. They've got depth in them. Mm. The, 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 the last quintet is odd like this. Um, 614. Um, I don't know. I know these things. I shouldn't know them. I mean, you don't, probably don't. But anyway, if you did, then it means something to you. But you listen to it and you think, why is this moving me? It's, it's not sad. It's not happy. It's, it's not. It's, it's somehow... It's it's just profound, mm. um, and that's like that. It's it's artificial. It's not it's not his sincere first great emotion, but in the sense that it's about death, it is. Mm. So his one of his greatest late poems addressed to Betty is exactly like that. It's neither sad nor happy, but it's just profound. It's just contemplative. Um, Morning again there in the snow, your small blunt footprints come and go. Night has left no more to show, not the candle, half-drunk wine, or touching joy. Only this sign of your life walking into mine. But when they vanish with the rain, what morning woke to will remain, whether as happiness or pain. Whether it's happiness or pain, it doesn't matter, it's life. Mm. That's mm. what we've got, and it's just this moment. Yeah. It's the most perfect Carpe D poem you've ever yeah, Carpe yeah. Diem poem. Yeah, yeah. It's also the most perfect elegy you've ever read. Yeah. And it's got three rhymes. And they're perfect rhymes. Well, they're not. They're diphthongs. They're the kind of rhyme you can't do in French or German mm. because they're on these strange diphthongs that we have in English. Yeah, yeah. Um morning again, they're in the snow. Oh. Yeah, yeah. The small branch prints come and go. Light is left no more to show. Not the candle half drunk. Wine. Yeah. Um, uh, this sign of your life walking into mine. But when they vanish with, with the rain, ain. Mm. So you've got O, I, A. Three rhymes of each. Mm. What a startling, weird, out of the... Uh, it's positively outlandish. Yeah. And yet you don't even hear it. No. It no. just feels right. And, it, and it's so, uh, and it's like, in fact, if you translated it into ancient Greek and put it in a scholarly book and put the name Sappho under it, no one would know. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing yeah. about it which couldn't be 
have been written three centuries B- mm. BC in Greek. All the elements of it, snow, wine, touching joy, touching yeah. joy. Yeah. And yet it's got that also, that brilliant Larkin-esque thing. Well, you were talking about swerving earlier on. Mm. Um, ger- gerundive phrases, I think mm. they're called, we would have called them. I mean, there's different, there's different um, ways of talking about grammar now. But his grammar is extraordinary. Mm. He, over and over again, he has phrases like that. What morning woke to, which is a big noun phrase. Yeah, it's a yeah. noun, actually. Yeah, yeah. But it's long. Yeah. And the end of ambulances is, is, is all one huge noun phrase. Mm. And in fact, the person who examined my, my published work to give me a PhD by published writing, which is what I got, um, who was... Um, then a senior lecturer or a reader, I think, at Manchester, wrote to me afterwards and asked, he said, I've never understood the end of this poem. Can you explain it to me? Because he knew he couldn't get it right. Um, For born away in dead and dare may go the sudden shut of loss round something nearly at an end. And what cohered in it across the years, the unique random blend of families and fashions, there at last begin to loosen. It's a single singular noun phrase. I had a long argument with Jane Thomas in in the office. In she didn't believe me when I said begin is plural, mm. although the phrase is similar. It's ungrammatical mm. because it's become plural while the person's falling apart, mm. and he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Um, and what cohered in it across the years? What cohered? It's still cohering. The unique random blend of families and fashions, plurals, there at last begin to loosen. At last begin to loosen, instead of begins, should be begins. Mm, yeah, yeah. And then you get the best one of all, which is an infinitive. You don't usually use infinitives, you usually use what phrases or, or noun phrases of a simpler kind. Far from the exchange of love to lie unreachable inside a room, the traffic parts to let go by brings closer what is left to come and dulls to distance all we are. It's, it, he's, he's flying by the seat of his pants. You, you, you shouldn't be able to get away with that. What is it that brings closer what is left to come? What brings closer what is left to come is far from the exchange of love to lie unreachable inside a room, the traffic parts to let go mm. by mm. the whole thing. No one yeah. else would write that. <laughs> no. I think what I love about talking to James Booth about Philip Larkin is his complete sense of excitement and astonishment at Larkin's poetry. It's so infectious. This is the final part of our chat with James, but we've had so much fun and such amazing feedback that I hope we can get him back again soon. And our thanks to James for all his time and help with this. We have lots of new Twitter followers at tiny underscore air. So a shout out to a few, Jazz Shambles, Lynn Barnsley, Carlos, Louise Marshall, John Robbins, and the lovely Anne O'Neill, who we hope to get on as a guest soon. Please have a look at philiplarkin.com, the Society website, if you'd like to buy some merchandise, make a donation, or even become a Society member. This podcast was produced by Simon Galloway, and the music is by The Mechanicals. If you'd like to be a guest, or have some ideas about future podcasts, please get in touch. The horns of the morning are blowing, are shining The meadow is wet With the coldest of dew